some aspects of today's gospel passage might make us a little uncomfortable because at its very core, it says we have to face sometimes what ideally should really be unthinkable. That is that there could be conflict and even animosity where there really isn't supposed to be any at all. And that is in that family that is called to be all loving, the community that is Christian, the church. But it is known that from time to time, people who are supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ have not always gotten along. That individual members of the church have sinned against other members of it. And a world where that happens all the time, people might be tempted to say, gee, get over it. The church isn't any different than any other gathering of people, any family or community. People are people. And when they're together, stuff happens that isn't good. And that may be quite true, even as regards the church, which is, as Pope Francis reminds us, supposed to be a hospital for sinners more than a hotel for saints. Yet what the gospel is telling us is that those sinners aren't ever going to get well in that hospital that is the church unless they submit to the treatment prescribed, which is the love that entails justice tempered with a very large dose of mercy. That is why Jesus outlined a way that justice might be served with mercy whenever a real offense occurs between people who are members of the household he established, the church. Indeed, rather than let resentment smolder and ultimately poison souls with hate, Jesus is telling us that we have an obligation to speak to those fellow Christians who have offended us, be they members of our parish or even those of our own circle of family and friends, and to do so first, privately, to see if we can resolve the problem without having to drag anyone else into the situation. If that doesn't work, then try to resolve it with the help of others who can help, but still keeping it contained so as not to compound things by sullying, sullying anyone's good name unnecessarily, but receiving the justice that is due, perhaps in the form of an apology or some practical restitution. Yet if all those attempts fail, then he says, bring it to the church, not by getting up at the end of mass and calling out someone because they've wronged us, but in terms of bringing it to the church and its ministers, commissioned, as Jesus said, to bind and to loose. That is, to convict and acquit. In other words, to help find a just resolution. Only then should it be brought beyond the bounds of the community of faith, even to a court of law if necessary, to ensure that justice is served. But in the times in which we live, if we were to check for baptismal records on either side of some of the more contentious lawsuits in our courts, we would undoubtedly find some who are supposed to be people of faith first. And sadly, they're pitted angrily and resentfully against one another. And we have to face the sad truth that even Christians are often more identified with the ways of the world than the ways of the church, and so seek justice, and in certain extremes, even vengeance from the world's institutions without ever first thinking of their identity and their responsibility to be followers of Jesus Christ, first and foremost. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus has a plan to save the world by transforming it in accord with the ways of God's kingdom, one heart, one life at a time, by calling each and every soul born into this world 
to discipleship in him. But if the world is still full of contention, division, and sadly, even hatred, rather than cooperation, unity, and love, it's not that Jesus' plan is a flawed one and he ought to try something new. It's rather that human beings do harden their hearts, even some who are baptized. So they're not always cooperating with that plan, most especially when interpersonal problems arise because of sin and retaliation is chosen before reconciliation is even ever thought of. And the resentment thereafter, we well know, can linger not only long, but seemingly forever. We can change that if we would but remember who we are first and foremost, not the many labels that this world applies to us or by which we might readily identify and define ourselves, but rather remembering ourselves to be baptized believers in Jesus Christ and thus hopefully his true followers. Jesus, who is not so naive as to think that there won't be problems at times between and among us as his followers, but who has told us that there is a way to resolve them justly, mercifully, and peacefully. And that alone could change not only the climate of our families and our families of faith, but potentially our entire communities, maybe ultimately the world.